Big el welcome, everyone. It's really, really great to see you all online tonight. Um, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So thank you all for coming along to the first edition of Antler's Ask Me Anything series. Today's session is designed to highlight why is a day zero investor your best bet? So my name's Nina. I'm uh, I'm the growth associate here and scouting associate at Antler. Also in the call are James, who is a partner of Antler Australia, and Joel, who's the scouting manager at Antler. So tonight we'll have James McClure, a partner at Antler, and he'll be sitting down with one of our portfolio company founders who has successfully built, launched, and scaled his company with Antler, Ash from Sapien. Uh, also, to let everyone know, this is just the first edition of our AMA, so we will have uh, AMA sessions every other Wednesday throughout November all the way to early January, and this is to shed more light on the founders that we back, the value of building with a co-founder, and our commitment in investing in women. So I really hope that I see you all in those sessions as well. So you're in for a treat tonight. We'll start the session with an introduction to Antler, followed by a really candid conversation with Ash. We'll be diving into his founder journey and experience building a company with Antler. And if at any point during the conversation uh, uh, you have a question or anything, please feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, we'll also have a dedicated time for Q&A uh, to answer any of your burning questions if you want to uh, take yourself off mute at that point. So uh, before we kick off, um, I just want to go over some general housekeeping. So uh, first, please uh, mute yourself if you're not speaking, just to avoid any background noise. And then if possible, please keep your camera turned on so we can see who we're speaking to. So let's get into it. Um, I'd love to introduce James, uh, our partner here at Australia, and he'll also, he'll do a quick introduction to Antler and moderate today's conversation. James, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thanks, Lena, and welcome, everyone. Really excited to get the chance to speak to you. Um, super quick background for myself. I'm operator turned investor, so moved to the dark side about a year ago, year or so ago, alongside, as you can probably tell by my accent, um, I'm not natively Australian, moved with my family recently. Prior to that, I was a uh, chief commercial officer of a Series C startup called Adzuna in job and job recruitment, uh, ran the enterprise business for a ticketing, market, a ticketing marketplace, working with Man City, Dallas Cowboys, etc., Early on, early stage employee at Airbnb, I ran a bunch of their markets in Europe and then launched Google's offices in South and Southeast Asia and launched YouTube across Asia. So, yeah, certainly both like early stage business going from zero to one is close to the heart, but also I, I know what it's like to have that investor turn around and shit all over the plans you've had for the last three months when they haven't really done anything. Hopefully, Ash will say I haven't done that with him, but we'll we'll get to that later. But firstly, just to give like a little quick flavor and overview of of Antler, who we are, where we've come from. So we're in most of the major startup businesses in, in the world, and we are actually the most active early stage investor according to, according to PitchBook. So we've made over 800 investments. There's more than a billion of uh, investor money that's been entrusted with us across our 25 locations, we have more than 250 people. But when you look at Australia, we run our uh, residencies in Sydney and Melbourne, but we recruit founders from all over Australia. We've made or we've got 81 active portfolio companies. The AUM number is increasing all the time as we have a 46 million fund one and we're oversubscribed for our 60 million fund two. And fund two is what is going to be investing into uh, the founders that are coming into this cohort. And across Sydney, Melbourne, we're uh, 18 people. But I think like, really what we're here to do is be a day zero investor and be the best place to start a business and enable the change that you'll want to see in the world with your chosen your chosen sort of expertise area so that's the flavor of antler the business but then what does this mean in who comes to antler who are the types of people that to build there's three sort of rough archetypes that exist there's one of tech product leaders so you can see there's some you know, fantastic people there from uh, businesses that we, we funded there's the more like business operator commercial style co-founder and then there's the domain experts where you know, they are one of the five to 10 people in the world or in Australia that know the most about certain thing uh, X. There's 
on the right hand side, there's you know some great logos of places where people have come from. But I think it's also really important to talk about that logos don't necessarily translate into founder DNA and other areas. And some of our most successful founders have come from uh, less obviously high profile logos, but like we've had good success in different areas. Then if you look at the style of like what stage of career, like the average person is going to be a little bit over 10 years into, into their work experience, more than half of will have done something like this before. And we, we've got a pretty good split between the more tech domain and the business operational side. So if you imagine yourself and looking around on day one uh, and uh, in an antler, uh, antler office location, these are the kinds of people that you would look around and see. And then what does that actually mean for the businesses that we invest in? This is a, a, a broad range of, of different, different areas. I think what's important for, for us in terms of our thesis is our thesis is not around, we believe the next stage of the world will be saved by B2B SaaS. Like we like B2B SaaS and we will invest, we'll invest in it, but we're founders, we're looking for the best founders to go after a particular problem. And we back people in areas as diverse as the most intricate cybersecurity you've ever heard of to a B2B SaaS platform for the fitness industry. Obviously like a very obvious area or something with lots of lived experience. And then also ones where there's probably only 50 people in the world that even understand what the nature is. So I think what you should take from this is probably like the value for our investors and why they come to us is diversification, but the value for founders and why people come to us is that we don't say this isn't a type of business we this isn't a type of business that we would invest in. Our bar is is this VC backable? And then we're looking to find the best founders to go after that particular problem. Then if we give like a couple of ideas of some of the companies that we have backed. And so these are three out of our fund one that we're excited to talk about. So one would be Path Zero. This is a uh, service for financial allocators and asset managers to understand the ESG supply chain implications and emissions for their entire portfolio. Um, this is actually where I won't talk about the founder who's listed. I'll talk about the founder who's not there. So there's Sharbs, who's the CTO. His original idea coming into Antler was a better way to make waste wastewater pipes. But actually, through talking to Carl, that actually where they found like a great set together was actually on solving solving major carbon emissions problems and the combination of their skills with Carl's background as a former hedge fund manager, allowed them to go down this, this side. Um, Upcover is SMB InsureTech in VC speak, or if you're an actual business or real person, that means you can you can go to the website and get uh, you can get your business insured in seconds for whatever type of business that you're doing. It's fantastic about this team is they've just been posting double digit month on month growth for about 36 straight months. CEO Sky, she would be a self-professed insurance geek not many of them around, but she is a self-professed insurance tragic. She, um, her co-founder is a guy called Anish. He joined Antler, at the Antler uh, cohort a week after relocating from India, exited a business there, and they were able to form a strong team. And then last one is Zalient. This is deep tech. So this is computer vision, be able to process who's actually in a picture or a video stream, not via the cloud, but actually on the edge of the chip that's in the technology. The Co-founder is not there is a guy called Chivi. He's uh, he commercialized this out of a PhD, and in during Antler he met Lars, who's three time exited. I think, I think we found him um, on a beach in Bondi, wondering what to do next after his previous exit. And their combination has gone on to be you know, someone that's been like into our one of our top valued companies. So those are some of the sort of stories that come. But what that actually means is we've got some great co investors as well as having some great stories in the businesses. And we're really pleased that there's been well over $100, $100 million of, of external capital that's gone into and the back companies. We've got some sort of enviable co-investors there. But I think also for, for the businesses, we have that 71% of businesses after Antler raise money within that first 12 months. So we get a validation from the external market that, uh, that the businesses that we are part of building and what you guys are actually building have what it takes to be successful like in a VC space. So I think the other key things that we follow on, so there's companies, uh, including, I won't name, but on this list that we, we put more than a million Aussie to work in this business over multiple checks. So we're not just a partner to get you started, but 
we back people through to Series A and it also has a global growth fund, which backs the winners out of the various ant locations. So in a successful scenario, and there would be a part of your capital raise strategy up till up till Series C. So that's like a really sort of brief overview of Antler, and it gives me a great pleasure to talk to talk to Ash, who is co-founder of Sapien. So, just as a brief overview, Ash, please tell us a little bit about your background, and then just introduce Sapien, what it does, how you're going. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, James. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ash from Sapien. So professional background wise, I started off building a corporate fund in Australia that is now a $200 million fund that looks to translate intellectual property from healthcare and life sciences portfolios from universities across Australia and overseas and build them into venture backable, PE backable companies. And the biggest companies we've licensed and commercialized include Cochlear and more recently Synchron, which competed against Neuralink to become the world's first FDA approved clinical trials product for BCI, brain computer interface, then moved into consulting because I thought it was going to change my life, which it didn't. And then eventually early stage startup at a company called Virtual, which allows retail investors to invest in private companies like Sapien from as little as $100. Um, joined them when they were around $500,000 in ARR and moved them up to five and a half million in nine months before leaving to join Antler. Sapien, uh, just for context, we're an at-home diagnostic for male fertility, so sperm analysis for the 200 million aspiring fathers around the world who are struggling to conceive and feel stigmatized. Now, sperm samples are pretty hard to work with. They die one hour post collection, and this adds workflow burdens and strains for labs and clinics. And there's a viability and accuracy concern for patients. Moreover, um, most men would agree with me that they would refuse to go into the clinic to get tested in the first place. And there's an emotional, and, uh, emotional barrier and a $500 price tag associated with getting a sperm analysis done in Australia and overseas. And that's, again, all the way if you wait an average of 12 to 18 months to access the test in the first place. What we do at Sapien is we deploy two patent pending technologies that extend the shelf life of sperm from one hour to three days, making it possible for you to ship a sample from home using Australia Post to a clinic. So we've managed to build an at-home proposition now retailing at 149, which is cheaper than going into a lab despite actually being 135.4% more accurate and efficacious. And outside of being the only fertility diagnostic internationally approved by the TGA, FDA, and CE, we now work with some of the largest IVF clinics and pharmacies across the world to test men in the comfort of home. That's us. Good stuff. And, and so, I mean, this is like, I guess, an early stage in career investor, consultant, startup, and then like running running your own business. Like, talk to me about what what prompted you to come towards Antler? What was in your mind? How you discovered it? And what yeah. made you actually like apply and start to take that leap? Um, so while, whilst I was at Birchall working on early stage investments for a startup, I had a side idea in loyalty programs and I'd convinced Hugh McCaffrey, who is now the COO of yeah. <laughs> Investments and other one of Antler's portfolio companies to quit his job at Freehills and come join me. Um, and look, it was a terrible idea. We had nothing validated and we applied to Antler because we thought, well, there's an opportunity to go build something, quit our jobs and try something at it. But we got a call back from Antler that said, well, we like you as individuals, but we hate your idea, which rightfully so. Uh, <laughs> we came in wanting to validate the proposition, but um, very quickly disbanded and realized that we had core expertise in other areas, perhaps better suited to explore other ideas. I think what prompted me to apply to Antler specifically is quite simple. Um, having come from investments on my own, I find that it's hard to find true pre-seed capital in Australia. It's not just many funds out there just won't write you a check when you have a team and an idea with bare minimum validation. And that's where Antler was significantly different and that you genuinely understand what a first check is. And that and the fact that everybody assembled as part of the program already had some kind of risk appetite. So it's really hard to go out there and find a group of people who all already have motivation and able to jump in and, and begin to build at around the same time. So let, let, let me just c confirm the, so this was, you had your idea killed before you even came in, but like, but well, actually what, what ended up was two separate businesses. So um, right. reach, reach Alternative Investments is the business that he's referring to that you um, originally uh, yeah. were looking to build with. Like what was, can I ask like what, 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 what was it? Don't know, I, I won't flame the idea, but like what was, yeah. what, what was it that you came in to just get a flavor of what that looks like versus Sapien? Yeah, absolutely. Look, we came in, I, I wanted to build a fintech loyalty program that effectively was a collective of all businesses in Australia. I mean, think of it as a sort of Starbucks card, but across a number of businesses in Australia. 
uh, it's been done before and we really struggle to get validation on the business. Cool. And then so fast forwarding into like that start, start point of Antler, like what was that like, what was your belief going in of that value proposition? And what did you see happening through both like pre-investment, but then post? Yeah, absolutely. Like someone really smart told me a few years ago that companies fail for three reasons, um, bad money, bad founders, and bad friends. And with Antler, I think one, uh, you do a really good job at assembling a cohort of individuals that have the potential to be good friends and influences as you try and build the company. I'm still in touch with a number of people that I went and did Antler with that continue to support the business, both as potential investors and also uh, as people that have helped from an operational standpoint. Two, there's also a really good set of operators part of the Antler network that have either built something on their own or have relative expertise to offer. So you're minimizing bad money risk. And three, there's also a, a support network that I think that enables founders that want to become good founders and ultimately good leaders because those are two separate things. Um, I think that's the primary value problem that holds true to date. And you know this, James, but I've relied on Antler to get advice and had Antler pull me out of a ditch before and connect me with other operators as when I needed support. And the other thing that's really interesting to me is you've proven to be a really involved investor over the over the last couple of years, which having raised from multiple funds in the past, I can tell you that's pretty rare. It's often then uh, it's um this is it's 2021, you're in you're in at the cohort. It's it's Melbourne, it's lo it's lockdown, right? Um you, you spent you said before that your previous idea, the loyalty fintech, you couldn't get validation to happen. Um talk to me about like sapien validation. How do you go about validating this idea? Yeah, like the solution we had in mind for Sapien uh, was quite technical in that if you can't prove that the transportation medium, which is a medium that we utilize to extend sperm samples shelf life, effectively works, I don't have a business even if I can validate demand for the product. And during the program, we worked on building a solution, but then had to validate it during the lockdowns, which meant that we couldn't travel more than five kilometers from home. So my co-founder and I had to sign up to be Uber drivers. Uh, we needed to drive samples effectively from people's homes all the way to Australian Clinical Labs, which happened to be our partner lab at the time, which was around 20 kilometers away from Melbourne City. We go door to door every morning for a week, collect sperm samples from strangers and drive them over to Australian Clinical Labs and do it all over again the next day. And once we um, ran those trials and got some kind of approval on the, the actual product, we had to validate that we could sell product at a certain price point. There was a willingness to pay for it. So at this point, we built a wait list of some 5,000 people in Australia and sold roughly around 10 test kits, uh, door knocking effectively in Victoria before raising from Antler. How much did you make on the Uber, the Uber journeys? We'd book ourselves in. <laughs> <laughs> Creative use of funds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We just had to get Abdul, my co-founder, uh, to, to stand outside the Uber, book a ride in so I could accept, be the first person to accept it um, and, and drive away. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I mean, so, I mean we're, we're making this one, like there's obviously uh, some jokes in this, but like, this is not an obvious business to either start or to actually like get funded. You know, the, the classic uh, insert VC thing of let's just get some a nice marketplace and B2B SaaS. Like what's your advice to the non-pure software builders out there, both in like what it takes to get started and how they should approach things? Yeah, look, I, I love physical products. This is a really hard question because the market isn't necessarily built for physical products, particularly in Australia, where the expertise is driven towards B2B SaaS, but also because physical product as a category is very nuanced and varied. Um, if you're building a business that um, you know is in the business of manufacturing effectively, you need to understand the economics and the working capital requirements of your product and AQs and know that your MVP may not always be easy to get up and running and that you may not always be able to cut corners in the process and build a scrap duct tape product. And that's where it gets most businesses really confused because you're, you're taught on the consistent basis that you need to build an MVP really quickly and agile, but you can't necessarily do that, particularly in a healthcare product where your MVP needs to work and needs to be regulated. The standard of your V1 ready to sell product may well be much, much higher than the standard of a V1 ready to sell software solution. Mm -hmm. So it was important for us at the very, very beginning to work with our investors and understand that we need to take it slow and steady because you don't want to rush into a distribution model you're not ready for. Um, but that said, I think the easy thing with physical products is operational complications end at a certain point and you're always working towards building a playbook that at one point can scale. 
So every minute, as long as you're building and talking to customers and working on building that playbook, and if you survive long enough, you might get lucky. Because what playing about it sounds like the, the, the key things to like lessons would be, if you could go back and advise yourself earlier on, is that I have a really high bar for what an MVP is and that often the kind of like startup mantra is that minimum viable product should be pure minimum, but when it comes to something which is like a high... Um, well, both high value, but high like emotional value and regulated yeah. product that needs to be higher. And then secondly, the benefit of physical goods is actually the operations are more, as you said, um, rinse and repeat. What Once you get over yeah. the, those more difficult hard yards, that's all a fair, a fair bit. Yeah, absolutely. And then for the, like, what's the thing that you thought when you started that has been proven wrong? Yeah. Uh, we started off thinking that we could circumvent the, the health system as most healthcare startups do and sell directly to cons consumers. And it works for, for, for a small period of time effectively because when you find your earliest adopters, people that already understand that there is some kind of an issue with their reproductive health, sure, you can find those customers and sell them online via Facebook ads. But in a business that requires some kind of category creation, it gets ridiculously difficult um, to be able to build something on Facebook effectively when you're trying to build that category along with it. So we were right that the product is valuable, but we were wrong about who it's valuable for. Uh, we had to go find a new customer, which effectively for us at the moment is the IVF clinic. And there's a workflow strain. Most IVF clinics at the moment are private equity owned, which means the first thing they want to get rid of is a cost center, which is testing. And they want to replace it with um, revenue generating activity, which for most of them is procedures. So we take on the cost, cent uh, the cost center, which as a standalone is a very profitable offering. And we're able to, in the process, also service man and guy for the initial problem we went after. And so I think, well, um, for, the, for the benefit of, of others, like what Ash is very sort of delicately glossing over is that this is quite a large pivot. And uh, this is this has happened, you know, um, post Antler initial funding, yeah. but yeah. probably post your next round as well, the move from yeah. pure, like pure D to C to it being B to B to C, right? That's right. And yeah. like, so, how, did, how was that to actually... Actually, you, know, you talk about it as if it's you know um, it's the obvious one, but like the pivot is a is a hard bit to navigate and move through. Again, like what's your advice on um, on like navigating those bits when you've already got a going concern with investors on board? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, the big consideration there was with a D 2 C business, we could very easily build a business that would generate five million dollars a year and would never get any further than that. And that wasn't a strong enough proposition for us to put money in, particularly when capital raising became really difficult. So the big and most obvious question was who else is going to pay for this? But that's not an obvious answer there because most people wouldn't necessarily tell you that an IVF clinic, which offers testing on its own, would be the right kind of customer because on paper you are competing against a revenue channel for them. But um, it, it is an iterative process to try and get as much feedback as possible from the industry and try and sell into existing players who has the capability to finance this. Because one thing healthcare businesses and most businesses get incorrect at the very beginning is you don't understand that you don't have a business model. And a business model isn't just a B2B, a B2C situation, but also who effectively the payer is going to be. And sometimes your payer is very different from your customer. And that takes a long time for most businesses to understand. And we had to go through a massively iterative journey through that process to understand ultimately the product's going to be used by the end user, the man, but the payer in this case, or the, the distributor for us would be the IVF clinic. Yeah, I think that's sort of that nature of working through value chain is the sort of things that it's, this is the second, third or fourth level of validation right. that you kind of, yeah. that you get to and, and work things through. That's right. And, and it obviously started becoming, uh, becoming really, really clear how we were going to scale the business because every single IVF clinic that we work with inherently do between 5,000 and 15,000 cycles of IVF uh, per year. And that is an opportunity uh, of 5,000 and 15,000 customers per distribution channel which otherwise would have costed us tens of thousands of dollars per month to scale via Facebook ads. So the ability to distribute has become a lot cleaner for us. Well, then like the what's next for Sapiens? So you've got your, your first IVF clinics on board. Yeah. You are, you're still doing, you're still doing some D2C, but it's primarily IVF clinics. Like talk to you about what's, what, what would, if you see, if we see you in the next six months, what, what's going to be happening? So with Sapien, um, one of the goals we started off was with to make the male fertility test as accessible as a pregnancy test, not to become a lot more obvious with the IVF distribution channel. And but that only uh, you, you can only see that goal out to fruition if you effectively start treating screening diagnostics as a volume game and stop making the distinction between affordability and accessibility. 
So that's the, the goal for the next two years per se. But for over the next six months, the idea is to go from five international clinics that we work with at the moment to around 30 international clinics and to take our partnership with Capri White, which is a pharmacy chain we just launched with, into national distribution and ultimately across other pharmacies internationally where we can replicate that model. And ideally, we would have tested 20,000 men in that period of time. And that's what we're Fantastic. And then, and then, and then like, last question, then we'll turn over to the, we've already got a few questions coming in, is like, imagine yourself on like day one of Antler. What, what would be your advice to someone who's, who's going in at day one? Uh, don't be afraid to say yes to things that you didn't, don't necessarily understand. Be open to it and be able to make the distinction between things you don't know and things you don't understand, because sometimes those are two different things. Uh, you don't always run into opportunities that have the ability to create transformational value in life, particularly ones where you can walk away with capital at best case scenario and go after a big problem. And at worst case scenario, 10 to 12 weeks later, you're more employable than you've ever been. So the opportunity cost of this is so low for so many people considering at the moment. So the economically smart decision might be to actually just commit to it and give it a good shot. But also the second thing there is don't be afraid to go after big problems you don't always want to treat incremental problems and you don't know. You just need to recognize that incremental solutions don't always result in incremental value. Brilliant. Th thanks, Ash. So uh, we'll, we'll turn over to questions. If you sort of put the hand up, the virtual hand up on Zoom, whilst everyone's getting themselves and getting themselves ready to ask a question, I'll take some, a couple of the ones from the, like from the, from the chat. Uh, from Dre, Ash, how did you go about assessing co-founder fit? So what was it about Abdul that you really liked and maybe what, what were the things that you from other people that you spoke to that you went, uh, maybe not? Well, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Like, I think you come in feeling like, or at least the very least I came in feeling like I could work with many people, but you very quickly figure out that that's not the case, particularly when you want to build a business with this person over the next five, 10 years. And you want to understand what your fundamental advantage is going to be as a team. So have hard conversations really early on, understand whether or not you have the right objectives in mind, both of you, because building a big business can get really tiring. And the bigger thing that people don't understand is when I tell people I'm tired, is it's a result of me being physically tired and emotionally drained, as opposed to me being like doing intellectually stimulating things on a daily basis. So startups get hard because it's taxing, not necessarily always because you're doing the smartest things. So you need people that can ultimately provide stamina to the team and, and can go with you the whole way. So have the hard conversations early on and recognize that you, some people want to move the needle and some people want to create massive change. So where, where do you fit in and, and commit to that vertical? Fantastic. Very good advice. Uh, we have another one of, uh, is the 1 billion valuation goal the minimum that investors will get excited about? Uh, Ash, I know you, but both with your investor hat and your, CEO hat on, what's your view of that? And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer from the Antler perspective. Well, it very much depends on the fund, right? <laughs> exactly. Very much depends Precisely. on the economics of the fund <laughs> and whether or not, you know, return can, can prove economically profitable for that fund. And that depends on the scale of the fund you're talking to and the mandate of that fund. But look, um, physical products, uh, the ability to demonstrate billion dollar valuations only become clear when you can demonstrate repeatability. Right, with, with a solution like Sapien, if we we're selling direct to consumer and we sold one product per customer, it's a lot difficult to demonstrate with that existing uh, cohort of people that would be able to achieve $100 million in revenue. But when we go after IVF clinics, for instance, the repeatability is almost guaranteed as long as we don't change the we don't churn the customer out. So understand business models, understand effectively how you're going to be able to demonstrate billion dollar valuation in a realistic approach. Uh, ultimately, we all know there's a bit of fluffing everywhere but go after the funds that best suit your business model and your return profile. Yeah, I think from the Anna perspective, it's, it's very similar to what Ash says, that it's, you want, as, a, as a venture investor, you, you want to believe that there is a 1 billion plus valuation opportunity out there for this business. So that, let's say, a, a consultancy, which could be a fantastically profitable and potentially great individual investment that could throw off lots of dividends, if it's something that has to scale by the hours of man hours or person hours that put in, that ends up not getting to that kind of level. Or if you put it from why people come, why put people invest into Antler is they're looking for minimum 3x their money back and ID 5x. If we're putting 70 million to work uh, into Australian startups over the next four years, we need to believe that's going to be well north of 200 million to come back. If our average stake at an exit, just to make the math simple, is 10%, there needs to be 2 billion, 2 billion worth of exits out there. 
you can cut that in many ways. You can have one times two, you can have two times one, you can have whatever, six times 500, but the VC is a power law game and disproportionate returns do come to the bigger sizes. So the direct question is, obviously there's the, it depends on, so the direct one is, if you can't point a path to there being a billion dollar market out there, you are pushing uphill. Doesn't mean it's a no, but you're gonna need to be able to showcase other ways as to why this will be a great investment. All right. Uh, anyone on the on the call? I've I've got you warmed up with some of the uh, some of the written ones, and I will work through them as we go. But I just want to give any uh, live questions. So someone's come off mute. Uh, uh, and Kit, do you want to go? And then Dre, I see you. You'll we'll come to you next. Yes, I I just wanted to uh, understand how like we can bring in uh, an idea or a concept. Uh, especially like a lot of people are focusing on like, you know, use scale and growth. But if you're looking at research and development, especially in, you know, farming sector or agriculture sector, how do we bring that into it? And is Antler uh, if, you know, place to bring that kind of, you know, uh, ideas in? So then we've, I, as I said, we're a vertical agnostic. We're looking for the best founders in their chosen problem area. If I think of our most recent, like I see, we've approved uh, an investment in a hardware for uh, managing wastewater wastewater facilities in a factory. Like that is not classic software in any sense. Um, so I think, like, I would encourage you to bring bring idea, but probably then also going to Ash's point of earlier on, I would encourage you to be open minded around working with us on what what flavor this idea is both in terms of the business model or the or the style within the problem you're going after and or how else we can approach it so we welcome people coming in with ideas and some of the if i think of things we've invested in if i think of the time i spoke to them before the program and what we invested in it's quite similar there's times when it's the same problem but a different solution and then there's times where maybe a bit like ash if i'd done your interview it's like well, is this, this is like two entirely different businesses, but actually got the same guy behind it. Thank you very much. And Trey? Uh, thanks, James. Thanks, Ash. Um, my question is to Ash, and it's one I put in the chat, but I thought I'd ask it just to have a different tempo. But my question to you, Ash, is, you know, um, medtech can be quite exclusionary in terms of doctors and nurses being gatekeepers. So how did you actually build the trust of the community, um, the medical community for your product and for your business? Uh, medtech is pretty difficult, uh, but also it, it's, it's a two-way street, right? I mean, most startups are out there trying to sell products effectively, blaming the health system for being shit. But you need to recognize that you can't necessarily sell within the health system without the support of incumbents. So in, in, a, in a pandemic scenario, for instance, as much as we claim we don't trust the health system, we all very easily run to the hospital. So the health trust is still significantly high. So don't discount it and build. The only way to do it is to not pitch it as a founder and to, is to get enough key opinion leaders from the industry to pitch on your behalf. We started off with Dr. Gavin Sachs, who sits on the clinical board of IVF Australia. There's a significant buy-in process at every step of the way. But the thing you find within medical systems is as long as you make people feel like they're on a pedestal, they're willing to do things for you. So we built a clinical governance board. We have a number of people part of that governance board. And as long as you can provide them enough value and there is enough efficacy data there and ultimate value to patient, because just because you're... And also don't forget the commercial aspect of things because most clinics at the board level are making decisions because it's a top line or a bottom line impact not because it impacts the patient. Impacting the patient is a nice to have. So as much as you want to build a product that impacts the patient because you're building an FDA, TGA, CE approved product, you ultimately still want to understand that there's an economic viability component that needs to be pitched into clinics. Second thing there is you may not always need to sell to the healthcare practitioner directly when you're building a product. You may also want to consider selling to the board of a clinic. So different incentive sets and then trickle down from there. Nice one. Uh, Benny, we'll go to you, then we'll do one from the chat. And then I think, uh, Tom, you'd be up next. Is that cool? Yep. Benny, go for it. Yep. Uh, thanks for the talk, guys. Um, my question is more of a general question. Is there a deadline for the application uh, for the upcoming uh, Antler cohort? I, it starts 29th of January next year. I encourage you to 
uh, go through process as early as possible. Main reason being that this is this is a community led thing, and we've got plenty of examples of people who are talking to potential founder co founders and working and having access to ideas and opportunity before that day one starts. So uh, we 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 will be interviewing up until like the last stages. But I think if it's something you are considering, I'd encourage you to start earlier rather than later because in the scenario where uh, you're, you're, we move through and you accept our offer, then the day one on the 29th of January is actually the first physical day. There's days my, zero, minus one, et cetera, of the build up to that and the access to like, other other co-founders and the existing cohort. Okay, yeah, thanks. Sure. I've got one for Ash on Sapien. Are you in a red ocean or blue ocean and do you have competitors out there? We do have a couple of competitors out there and we can put the red ocean in our approach. Um, there's, there's a couple of different things there. We have the most efficacious product in market. We're the cheapest product in market, despite being most efficacious. We have regulatory approvals. There's no reason for our competitors to exist. Very cool. Uh, Tom, over to you. Uh, Ash, that's really cool technology. Uh, what type of D classification were you and how? Uh, what's the new normal time period of getting a diagnostic like uh, yours onto the market? Uh, yes, so we had a declaration of conformity in Australia, so IVD class one in Australia. In the US, we needed two different approvals. We needed a class three approval for our civilization medium and a class one for the diagnostic. Um, CE, again, IVD class one, it's a transfer over from the FDA. Typically takes anywhere from uh, a year to as, as many years as, as you will need to build data profiles in your business. And uh, did you manage to get reimbursement classification? I know that uh, the Medicare sometimes covers IVF procedures. Uh, not in the male fertility side of things. So trying to build and sell into PBAC would be really difficult from a health economics perspective. Australia's just not there yet. Yeah. And, and you find customers are still happy to pay it because you were able to get the cost so low? Uh, we're cheaper than going into a lab. So we don't, we don't make the lab look like a real option. Awesome. Um, and insurers, are they interested in it? Like, uh, or have you talked to them at all? Um, we are in conversations with insurers, but again, reimbursement and health economics perspective, we're not necessarily anything preventative. It has a large opportunity cost for insurers at this point in Australia. Our insurance market isn't built well enough to afford that. Are you able to make a pitch or something like that? Or is that what your strategy is? I, I imagine some insurers would be interested if it saves them costs, you know, having to go fork out more bills for, for uh, you know, diagnostics in the future to figure out why fertility isn't working or something like that. Uh, yes, but the life cycle and the ability to build that cost profile will take us a long time, uh, potentially a couple of years, if not more. Uh, it's just not a good use of resources for us at the moment. Awesome. Uh, it's a good, good uh, distribution like channel, not, not a good reimbursement pathway at the moment. It's cool, really cool story. Congrats. Thanks. So thanks very much, Tom. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll move to one chat, um, one from Amir. Do you need to have an MVP before you see the investment committee? Like, short answer is no. Like, we'll, we, uh, we won't say to you, you're too early stage for us. So we, we can invest pre revenue, pre products, pre MVP, but it depends on the business. What, what we will say is, you don't have enough validation. So if I take an example of um, a business that we funded this year, this is Anda, it's a D2C wearables, which would, is effectively a bracelet that will help you regulate your breathing. Uh, ahead of IC, obviously this is something that needs to get built. They were, There's not no opportunity to be able to design and build this in 11 weeks. But what they were able to do was to very strongly validate through both wait lists, but also demonstrated willingness to pay as well as a bunch of other activities that there was a large addressable market and they were able to talk us through their supply chain plan, what their launch plan on Kickstarter would be, what funding they would be able to get to and crucially when timelines would happen for an MVP and launch that helped us gain confidence about that obviously there's risks, there's obviously risks in venture, but that they had the opportunity to be able to realize that. So that's an example of both, I guess, another physical product business, but also one that a bit like Ashes that I imagine you didn't necessarily have the uh, IC. I imagine you weren't saying, hey, look, we've done 1,500 samples already. 
like what 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 was the stage that you were at at investment committee in terms of like the physical product of sapien uh we had we had a product that looked like it came out of etsy right so <laughs> an understanding of effectively what that needs to look like so it's a terrible product you can't sell to an end consumer but all the other moving parts were sort of we had a response to we had partnerships with lab chains in australia and we had a wait list that could potentially validate the the willingness to pay Got the other bits going to the chat about what's Anna's thesis for deciding uh, investment. So, I mean, we we've got three sort of main categories that we that we talk through. One is a mo- and is ordered like this for a reason. Is like founders. Is there an unfair advantage? Have we seen leadership, charisma, grit, resilience from from the this set of this set of founders? Number two is the product. Like, is this something that we believe has got? defensibility it's got an unfair advantage there is a uh, like clear traction and usage around it number three is like the total market that it's playing in and and when we have we invite external guests to our investment investment committee so external vcs and and the partners from around the world to I mean we get diverse perspectives what we say and literally this is what i said beforehand if you are if you are very positive on the founders but you have question marks about the product and the idea you should vote yes, because the founders are what you're going to be investing in. And as Ash has shared, what you, what you, the slides that you see in the investment committee may not be the business that actually is there six, 12, 18 months later. But if you are, if you really like the product and the market, but you're a bit iffy about the founders, then don't get too seduced by what you would do if you were CEO or what you think the business can be. You need to focus to who those founders are and whether you believe they can execute on that plan so obviously there's there's more like scorecards and process that go into it but that's like the overall flavor and that's again why we our thesis around founders rather than our thesis being on specific verticals any more live questions yeah john uh yeah question for you james uh with respect to the investors moving into different funds and then the funds investing in these opportunities what's the lockup of the investors how permanent is the capital so you mean investors into antler correct antler funds. yeah 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 so so uh, so we have um two funds the fund one finished deploying its initial capital at the end of 2022 fund two started deploying writing initial checks at the start of 2023 fund one is still writing follow-on checks to people like ash and uh and others so there's no kind of like competition between the funds as in the initial checks are only coming from one fund at any given time. Our investors, this is a 10 year fund and yeah. our investors know that we, our capital call schedule is uh, 25% on, on like sign, then 25% uh, 12 months after and into year three. We then make, depending on how we are progressing in terms of fund reserves and follow-ons, we then make uh, we'll make a later decision around when the capital calls happen, but the investors are signed, they're locked in, and I do not believe we've had a default. Yeah, okay, so it's a 10-year it's lockup for the ultimate investors. Correct, yeah. Thank you. If you want to see an information memorandum, I'm happy to uh, to, to talk. We, 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 we like talking to potential LPs as well as founders. Yeah, that would be interesting. Oh, cool. Thank you, John. Okay, I've got one from Sharath, and then I'll come back to you, Tom. Uh, So selection grouping of co-founders and team happens in the first week before building MVP or 11-week effort or after the program and ICE decisions. So I think, like, this is where, and I'll I'll let Ash tell you, like, what it actually feels like. But this is, imagine you've got, there's going to be, let's say, 70, 70, 75 people starting day one some will have made some connections like beforehand as i alluded to in benny in the answer to benny's question but like this you are looking to find co-founder many of you uh we aim to provide the i guess like the tools like ash said around like how to ask some of the difficult questions how to surface some of those we're providing the opportunities to do these like design sprints um and to work with a variety of people but like you're we're all we're all big boys and girls it's you're looking to, you're here to build a business so that means we believe you're looking to find the best person to be able to build that business with and so this these can happen on like 
day one. It can happen beforehand. But I think the key thing to, to say is that there are multiple scenarios of teams coming together quite late and potentially after having worked with quite a few other people in the, in the cohort. This isn't um, one shot you're getting married. This is you get the opportunity to see what lots of different people like. And this isn't we don't have a set time that you must do something by but I'll let um I'll let Ash tell you what like you you what you saw in your experience albeit virtual COVID time so maybe not yeah, quite as uh, person, actually um, oh, right. oh sorry of I forgot. most yeah. of the program in person yeah. um I I met my co-founder on day one during an Adler uh, sort of speed dating moment and we we both nerded out about Theranos and the the nuances with those business models. So it made perfect sense for us to catch up and have more conversations in detail. But at the same time, there were businesses that went through investment committee, didn't really make it, came back, reformulated strategies and rebuilt teams, went back in again and raised capital. Um, don't look to Antler to hold your hand, but they're really good at facilitating discussions. So if you can't find people in the first few weeks, you will, if you can commit to it, you you, you could potentially find people over time. Cool. Uh, Tom, and then I've got a couple more to go through on the uh, on the chat. I just wanted to know if you you had many medical type companies coming through, or at least medical background uh, founders, science or, or or medicine itself, and nursing or healthcare in general. Uh, we have an IC tomorrow, and we have a, P a PhD in psychology who is going to be what is one of the one of those team members, and it's uh, it would in the it's looking to is in the mental health space, TGA, et cetera, certification would be a later stage one. So that's, for example, in the most recent batch, like Alaska, we also had a, a team who was looking to do uh, improved way of biomarkers that came through, went to IC. We ended up declining, um, but not because of the industry, uh, more because of around like the, the founders. So certainly we have a good stream of like med tech style businesses. Oh, I'm sorry. I've, I, in, we, we actually backed... Uh, a team called Onco Revive. They're looking at doing better way of liquid biopsy for diagnosing early stage breast cancer. So that's a team mm. backed out of the last cohort. Two PhDs, uh, yeah, like both medical background. Amazing, cool. Uh, All right, so uh, we've got uh, what's the percentage of failed start failed versus successful startups through Antler? So fund one. We invested in 106 companies starting in 2019. 70 are still active. That's pretty good in terms of uh, if you think of the the we can tolerate in terms of getting the returns that we want for investors and by extension that meaning that there's a good amount of successful companies. We could be at 25 percent survival rate and still get to those stages. So we're really pleased as to as to where we are on that one. Um, does the team encourage or embrace an already implemented idea some in some other regional market for others relevance here in ANZ? Yeah, like, yes, this is a definitely like archetype of finding a seeing a problem in Australia or in a vertical that you know well and that a solution has happened in either another market or another vertical which you can translate over. A good example would be uh, out of the first group that we invested in this uh, this year. Genie Pay, they're uh, buy now, pay later, but for B2B marketplaces. This is, to the early question, this is definitely a red ocean in EMEA. And we had the benefit of um, actually both, both Genie Pay as the team going through the program, but also us in making our investment decision that uh, Antler Globally has backed one of the larger European players in this space. And that allowed us to both, for us as the investors, to gain confidence that APAC and Australia was actually a relatively blue ocean, but obviously it was a land grab to, to go after. But also for Genie Pay, they were able to avoid some of the early stage mistakes that the team in Europe had, had done because they don't really see themselves as competitive at this like at this stage. All right, jo Joel, help me out. Have I missed any? I think I've got a bunch of them, uh, but so we're probably getting towards like last call for live questions. Uh, none that stand out, but if I have missed any as well, um, please feel free to, you, you've still got your hand up, Tom. I'm not sure if you've got another question. Actually, or... the, the, um, if, if, I'll, I'll, there's actually a, an important one I want to cover from um, Amir where he's talking about what your policies on ideas that have overlaps with a, with an existing portfolio company. I think this is really like an important one to, to talk to about sort of, uh, handling competition. So I think we take a pretty 
liberal view of like of competition and the the reasons behind that are like a we are a wide stage investor and if you think of if you transport antler into the future there'll be like hundreds of portfolio companies but i think more importantly the way in which we look to handle it is is this something that uh one person's success means someone else's failure i think is the most important bit so if this is a um let's say like Let's suppose, let's suppose we back Salesforce and your idea is a better version of Salesforce. Typically, a business is only going to buy one CRM system and there's only a limited number of people that are going to do it. In that type of scenario, we're probably, we're probably going to say no on the basis of competition. But if it's something where there's multiple, multiple, you have multiple reasons to buy a particular thing. So let's say we backed booking.com and then Airbnb comes along um actually like especially at an early stage of playing such different sectors we would not we would not have a competition concern on that the reason why we're also quite liberal on this is again going back to what ash talked about before of the idea on that we say yes to i see is not necessarily what the business is going to look like a few years down the track i will Absolutely, last call for one last question. If not, we will uh, let Ash get back to his evening and you all back to your evenings. Go on, Dre, close us out. This is to Ash again. How in the heck did you get your friend to resign from Free Heels and join you on your wonderful journey of discovery? Have you spoken to a very tired lawyer before? It's not a very hard sell. Oh, okay. <laughs> So maybe co-founders, find the tired lawyers. Okay, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I really appreciate everyone devoting, devoting their, their time to us. And like I said, Joel's given a whole bunch of like links of people, so happy to connect over LinkedIn, answer questions. And again, look forward to seeing you all the process and hope to see a good number of you on January 29th. And thanks again, Ash. It's a real pleasure. Chat again soon, man. No, fantastic. All right. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.